that her Conditions that have to be just right have to be in place for those storms to to uh, to be created and to build and to uh, and to become a hurricane. You have to have those winds coming off of the coast of Africa. You have to have the warm waters of the ocean. You have to have the the right atmospheric conditions and the and the uh, moisture in the air for all of that to come together just right to start creating a tropical system coming off of those coasts that ultimately and eventually may become a hurricane. You'll notice about those hurricanes that it looks like somebody just stirred them up. And you might wonder, well, what's your problem? Who stirred you up? Who got you going? Well, it was those conditions. They were just right with those winds, with those temperatures, and with that with that moisture in the air where all of those just got stirred up just right to create what we deal with on this side of the world in a hurricane. As Kevin mentioned, we're talking about spiritual storms. What are those? This week you'll be talking about mental and emotional storms. You'll be talking about financial storms. You'll be talking about marital, I think, family storms and those, you know, those words, they, they, they mean something to us. We understand what that is, but spiritual storms, what are those? Those are the storms that will impact the destiny of your soul. Those are the storms, unlike every other storm that you are going to face in your life, those will be the storms that are going to determine how, the strength of your faith and the destiny of your soul. And just like those hurricanes require certain conditions to be in place and elements to be there to form just right in order to build into a hurricane, there are certain conditions that sort of have to be in place. Certain conditions that that lend themselves to us dealing with spiritual storms. We're going to talk about some of those conditions as we make our way through this lesson, allow the Word of God to teach us this morning. But just as you look at a hurricane and say, what got you all turned up? What got you spinning and in a bad mood all of a sudden? There's something that gets us stirred up spiritually. Let me not say that there's something. Let me say that there is someone who gets us stirred up spiritually and takes the certain elements and conditions and things that are present in our lives and uses those against us to stir up our lives and to bring about spiritual storms. You know who that is? The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. For your... You know what the next word is? It doesn't say your friend. It doesn't say your buddy. It doesn't say your your, your BFF. It says your adversary. Well, who's that? Well, the Bible tells you. The devil walks about as a roaring lion, stirring things up, seeking whom he may devour. I don't know who you are, and I, don't, and, and I don't know where you have been in life. I don't know what your spiritual relationship and your spiritual condition is with the Lord right now, but I do know that you have an adversary. Every single one of us have an adversary. We have an enemy that's doing all that he can to devour us. He's doing all that he can to keep our eyes off of heaven, to keep us from even making it to heaven. And he's doing everything that he can to bring storm after storm, spiritual storm after spiritual storm into our life, to stir us up and to mess us up and to keep us from heaven. This morning I want us to talk about how do we, how do we deal with that? As the theme of the lecture says, how do we prepare 
for those storms? And how do we overcome them? The devil is going to do all that he can to tempt you to do wrong. I used to think, I used to think that temptations were just something, well, I used to think temptations were a singing group, but that's a whole other story. I used to think that temptations were something that only young people dealt with. And that as you got older, temptations went away. And as you got older, you weren't tempted to do wrong anymore. And I used to look forward to the day where I would, where I would get old enough to where sin wasn't a problem for me anymore. I'm still waiting old from other individuals in my life that that day is never going to come. You don't, you know, there, there are certain things that you age out of. Have you noticed that? There are certain things that you age out of where people don't necessarily ask you to do certain things anymore because you've aged out of that and you've got certain things in your life and I've got certain things in my life. And I used to think, well, you just age out of temptation. You age out of sin. But that's not the case. You will never reach a point where the devil is not trying to get you. You'll never reach a point in your life where you are not being tempted to do that which is wrong. Now, don't think about sins as simply something that is an act of commission, where we commit an act that is in violation to the will of God. We need to remember that sins are also sins of omission where God has told us to do something and we omit obedience to that. And do you know that when we fail to do something God has told us to do, it is equally as sinful as violating something God has told us not to do. And no matter who you are, the devil is trying to stir things up in your life so that you will go against the will of God. I want to invite you this morning to get your Bibles out. We are going to spend time this morning in James chapter 1, in the verses that are on the screen in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 27, we are pretty much going to park ourselves in this passage, and we are going to let God teach us this morning. We're going to let God teach us this morning, how can we survive the storms of life? How can we prepare for them before we ever reach them? How can you get ready for the devil before you get there? I don't know if any of you ever played sports. Maybe you played football. Maybe you played basketball. I don't know if any of you ever played sports. And I guarantee, well, I, I guess, yeah, I'll just guarantee this, that you didn't just get together with your team and, and walk on, and I'm talking about organized sports here, you didn't just walk on the court to play some opposing team without preparing for the game. My basketball coach used to run us like crazy. Y'all ever heard of suicides? Those things are aptly named. Running the basketball court back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Those are called suicides because that's what you're doing. You're basically, because you're, and that coach would just run us like crazy. Why? Because he's trying to prepare us for the match. He's trying to prepare us for the day when we are actually involved in running back and forth and back and forth and back and forth in the game. We need to prepare ourselves. Even before we get into a match with the devil, we need to prepare ourselves and be ready for that so that we can survive it. Do you know that God has given you the power to open overpower the devil, to overpower every spiritual storm the devil's going to bring in your life. And so this morning, I want us to use the word overpower. And I want us to use the nine letters that make up that word. And I want us to walk through James chapter 1 and to see... Is tempted. Don't you dare say this, God says. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. This is all God's fault. No way, he says, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does God tempt any man. That's not the way God operates. 
So when you are tempted, don't you dare blame God. Okay, well, whose fault is it? Verse 14. But each one, but each one is tempted when he is what? When he is drawn away by his own, not somebody else's, not your wife's, not your children, not your parents, not your best friends, not, not the preachers, not the elders, not somebody else at church, not somebody at school, not somebody at work. It doesn't matter what their desires are when it comes to temptations. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and the devil entices you. I don't know what tempts you, but likely whatever tempts you doesn't tempt me. You know, your spiritual storms are not my spiritual storms. My spiritual storms are not your spiritual storms. We all have different storms. Why? Because we are all tempted by different things. I don't say this in, in, in a bragging way, but just as a, as, a, as a matter of illustration. I have never been tempted in my life to drink alcohol. I have never in my life had one sip of alcohol. And again, that's not said braggingly. That is said, I have never been tempted in that regard, but I know others are. Because we each deal with our own issues in life. If I'm going to prepare for the devil, if I'm going to overpower those temptations that come, I don't need to blame God for those temptations. I need to own up to what tempts me. I need to look within myself and say, where is it that I am weak? You remember science class? Did you ever dissect things in science class? For some people, that was the worst day of class. For some people, they would skip science class on the day of dissection. For other people, that was the only day they went to science class is when there was going to be some sort of dissection. That was the fun time when you got to actually do some hands-on stuff in science class. We need to do some dissection today. We need to peel back the layers and look inside of us. What is it that tempts me? Where is it that I am weak? Because you can't look inside of me and I can't look inside of you. I can only look inside of me. And I need to see what is it that, that the devil is coming after me. What buttons is the devil going to push with me? And I need to own up to my temptations if I'm going to overpower him. But God says if I do, I'm on the right track. If I do own up to these temptations, my own desires, then I can know when those are being played against me. I can know when the devil's pushing that button. So number one, if I'm going to overpower, I've got to own up to my own temptations. Number two is I've got to vote against sin. Somebody says, well, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Well, look at verse 14 and 15. Each one is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Verse 15. Then, when desire is conceived... It, it, what happens? It gives birth to sin. Here's desire. I have a desire. Is it wrong? Is it wrong to be tempted? The answer is no, it is not. Is it sinful to be tempted? Let me ask it that way. Is it sinful to be tempted? The answer is no. Jesus was tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin. It is not sinful to be tempted. I need to own up to my temptations, and I need to realize that the temptations come from my own desires. Verse 15 says, When desire has conceived, when I plant the seed, and water the seed of my desires and my temptations, you know what comes up from that? Sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And verse 16 says, don't you, bear, don't you dare be deceived into thinking anything else. When it comes to sin, the devil has, made, has cast his vote. The devil is all in. He has voted for you to sin. When it comes to you sinning, Jesus has cast his vote. 1 John 2 and verse 1, John says, I write these things unto you, brethren, that you may not sin. That is Jesus' vote for your life. 
and he is your advocate, verse 1 says there. He's your propitiation for your sins, in verse 2 there. The devil's cast his vote. Jesus cast your vote. His vote, guess what your vote is? It's the deciding vote. You get to decide whether you will give in to the devil's temptation. You get to decide if you will bring those spiritual storms into your life. Turn back just a couple pages in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11. Or if you're using some kind of electronic device, you're going to have to punch all over the place to get there. But for some of us who still use an old-fashioned Bible, it's just a page or two back to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11, we read that, that great chapter of faith about this, these Old Testament faithful. And I want us to look at, at, uh, at Moses in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24 and following. Because I want us to see where Moses cast his vote. Verse 24 says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He made a choice here. He could have been called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and, and, and got all the glory and the honor and, and, and everything that came with that, but he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 25, what does it say? Choosing, rather. He made a choice. Choosing, rather, to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin. Because what did he determine in verse 26? Verse 26 says he was esteeming something. He was counting something. He was looking at the choices. And he, he said, you know what? I am esteeming the reproaches of Christ as greater riches than these things that I have in Egypt, the treasures of Egypt. He looked at his choices and he said, here I can, I can go ahead and give in to these things. But notice what it says in verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. What did he choose in verse 25? To, enjoy the, to, to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin. He looked at that and he said, you know what, that's not going to last. But he saw the riches of Christ and he said, that will. The end of verse 26 says he looked to the reward. He had a laser focus on what he wanted. And he made a choice that said, I am not going to allow the devil to make this choice for me. I'm going to make it for myself. You know how hard that must have been? To be the one that was different. Moses, why don't you just blend in with everybody else in Pharaoh's house? Why don't you just go along with everybody else that's in Pharaoh's house? Why don't you just take what is yours that, that can belong to you? No. My sights are set on the reward. I'm going to cast my vote for God. If we want to prepare for and survive spiritual storms, we need to keep those storms from coming. And we can keep them by coming, by owning up to, recognizing our desires, voting against sin as, it, as, as we, it might come into our life. And then look at verses 17 and 18. We continue in James chapter 1. Look in 17 and 18 and, and realize that God says, if you want to avoid spiritual storms, you need to enjoy the goodness of God. Look in verse 17. What's the first word you've got in verse 17? Every good gift. How many of them? No exceptions. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from, is from above. It comes down from, from our Father of lights. Here's every good thing that you have in your life. It's from above. It comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of His own will He brought us forth by the word of truth that, he might, uh, that we might be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. If we want to... We want to avoid these spiritual storms. We need to look at how good God is to us. And we need to not just focus on, well, I don't get to do this because I'm a Christian. Or, well, why is all this bad stuff happening to me because I'm a Christian? I guess that's not enough. Focus on what's good about being a Christian. Focus on what's good. that God has given to us is the privilege to talk to Him in prayer. It's to go to Him any time we need anything. To go to Him and give thanks to Him for everything that He has provided to us. You know, when, when we think about storms coming, did you all pray 
for this storm that came through? I'm not saying did you pray for it like you asked for it, but did you pray about this storm that came through a few weeks ago? I'm sure that you did. We were praying where we were. You all were praying where you were. Other people were praying. And, and that, you know, why were you praying? Because you were concerned about what was going to happen. And aren't you glad we didn't get smacked by a Category 5 hurricane? Why were you praying? Because there was a storm coming. And you wanted to talk to your father about it. There are spiritual storms that the devil's trying to bring into our lives. You know what we need to do? We need to pray about it. And enjoy the promise of God that he's given to us, that he is going to protect us. You know, when Jesus gave that, that, that model prayer, the, these, this way to pray and things to pray for in Matthew chapter 6, what did, he pray, what did he say one of the things to pray for is? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus did not say, here is a prayer to recite. And just recite this over and over and over. That, that's never what Jesus taught about prayer. But I want to ask you, how often do you pray, Lord, please deliver me from the devil? How often do you pray that? Lord, please lead me out of temptation. Lord, please help me not to go down that path. We pray for all sorts of things. How often do we pray to God about the devil and about temptations and about these storms? You know what God's promise is? God's promise is that he will hear us, that he will respond and answer to our prayers. You know what God's promise is? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 13, there's no temptation overtaken you, but whatever is common to man. But here's three words I want you to remember. There's no temptation overtaking you, but such as is common to man. But three words. God is faithful. Do you believe that? Enjoy the goodness of God because he is a faithful God who will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you are able to bear, but will with that temptation make a way that the storm, the spiritual storm, but even when we are in the midst of it, you know, God's not shaking his finger at David and saying, David, I told you not to do that. Forget it. You're on your own. You know, if that's the way you want to go, you're just, you're on your own. God has given me a way of escape if I will look for it. Thanks be to God. He loves me enough that even when those storms are coming, he's going to provide a way for me to get out of them. Enjoy His goodness. If I'm going to prepare for, if I'm going to overpower these storms, the fourth place we're going to see, I need to rein in my impulses. Look at verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, is this a hard verse? Let, you see that word every again? Boy, it's like the Bible just pl puts that in there. When, when, ooh, let every one of you, what does this mean? It, it means there's nobody excluded from this. Let every man be swift, to hear. And, and by the way, this is not just talking to men here. Just, just in case you're concerned that the word man is here and the word woman is not here, this is applicable to all of mankind. So this is not just directed to the men who are hard of hearing or who have selective, anybody have selective, don't raise your hand, selective hearing. This is not just talking to males, okay? This is talking to all of us. Let every man and woman be swift to hear, but then slow down. Step on the gas, be swift to hear, and then slow to speak, slow to wrath. Because when you get involved in wrath, what does verse uh, 20 say? The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Wrath of man does not equal the righteousness of God. If you allow your impulses to take you so far that, that you get involved in wrath, you are not practicing the will of God. If I want to prepare for, if I want to overpower and overcome these spiritual storms, I need to rein in my impulses. I need to rein in my temper. I need to rein in my impulses that, oh, I want that. No, sir, David, that's not good for you. Don't get involved in that. Do you have, do you have a quick temper? Not asking for confession. No, I'm not asking for a raise of hands. Yeah, you have a quick temper? 
Are, are, are you one of those that, you know, just the slightest, the slightest thing just set you off? Somebody can say the wrong thing, look at you the wrong way, you know, and all of a sudden you, you just feel that adrenaline start juicing through your veins. You just feel all of a sudden, oh boy, they better back away or they're going to get a dose of something they're not going to like. You have those impulses? Is that going to lead to a spiritual storm? God says, don't create those storms. Rain those impulses in. book of Proverbs says that a quick-tempered man acts foolishly. I don't need to act foolishly. I need to get control of my temper. I think the verses on the screen are Galatians chapter 5, verse 23, 2 Peter 1, and verse 6. Both talk about the need that I have for self-control as a Christian. God says, add to your faith virtue, add to your virtue knowledge, add to knowledge self-control. The more I learn about the will of God, the more I need to learn to control my temper, my impulses, control myself. Brother and sister in Christ, if we don't learn to rein in our impulses, we are going to find ourselves in the midst of spiritual storms all of the time because the devil is just going to turn them up every time that he can. If I want to overpower these spiritual storms, come back to James 1, and he says, I need to purge the filth out of my life. Look at the first part of verse 21. Therefore lay aside, look at the word all. We've had the word every, every, every in this passage. Now we come to the word all. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. How much of it can I keep in my life? How, how, how much... How much of, the, of sin can, can I have just kind of tucked away in the corner of my life? God says, get rid of all of it. You have that same word all over in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8. you got the same word all uh, throughout Scripture. It says you need to get rid of all of these things in your life. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, he says, My beloved brethren, here's what I'm begging you. I'm begging you as pilgrims and sojourners to abstain from fleshly lusts because those things war against your soul. Do you know that you are at war with the devil? The devil is trying to, is trying to tap into your lust and to your desires, and he's trying to tempt you, and he is trying to put you at war with yourself. And God says, abstain. Run away from them. Flee from them. Purge the filth out of your life so that the devil doesn't have a place where he can get a hold of. Get control of those things in your life, and you'll be able to control those spiritual storms that come your way. We've got to move on. Go to number six on this. We need to obey the Word. In this context, where he's been talking to us about how to overcome... He's been talking to us about, here are some things that you can do in order to prepare for and survive these, these spiritual storms the devil's going to bring about in your life. The longest section here in this context, he says, you need to obey the Word of God. The end of verse 21 says, receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls, be, but, be, but uh, be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, in a glass, uh, some translations will say. And he observes himself and he goes away. And immediately he forgets what kind of man he was. But when he looks, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. I'm not that one who just looks and then goes away and looks and goes away. But he who over and over, continually, continually, looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, not being a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Do you know where your strength comes from to survive these spiritual storms? Your strength comes from the Word of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, you know Ephesians 6 where he talks about the armor of God and talks about all of the pieces of the armor of God that we're supposed to put on? God never says, you put all of this on and you will have strength in and of yourself. He never says the strength is going to be in ourselves. That context starts in Ephesians 6 and verse 10 by saying, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. 
And you go and you read through that armor of God and notice how many of those pieces have to do with the Word of God. It's not just the sword of the Spirit that's the Word of God. Read through those pieces of armor and notice how all of them have something to do with, with fashioning myself and adorning myself with the Word of God. Strength comes from getting into this book. Thy word have I hidden in my heart. Psalm 119, 11. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. How do I stop sinning? How do I stop spiritual storms? I get inside this book. And I get this book inside me. That's not enough. This pastor says, don't just be a hearer. Now go out and be a doer of what you find. And when we obey God's word over and over in, in, with, within Scripture, God is going to tell us that we will have the strength to overcome those things that would come into our lives. Look at verse 26. If we want to overcome and overpower these spiritual storms, here's a hard one. We've got to wrestle our tongues into submission. Verse 26 says, If anyone among you thinks he's religious, Oh, I'm all right. I'm a good guy. I'm, I'm not so bad. I'm not as bad as these other people. If any one of you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this guy who thinks he's religious, his religion is useless. How many storms in our lives, how many spiritual storms in our lives get started because of our tongue? That's probably why he says in verse 19, be quick to hear and then shut your mouth. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. You know how many problems come about in our lives because we open our mouths? Because we engage, our tongue gets engaged before our brain can stop it. God says, you're creating your own problems. You're creating your own storms. You want, you want to overpower these storms? Then you've got to learn to overpower your tongue. Over in James chapter 3, you know, it, it, it describes the tongue over there as a world of iniquity set on fire by hell. O over in James chapter 3, it talks about our tongue, and it says that, it has, see how great a forest a little fire kindles. What does that sound like? A storm? A little, a great forest can be set on fire by a little spark. We can create great storms in our life by not controlling, not bridling our tongue. Brother and sister in Christ, we call ourselves a Christian. We call ourselves a follower of God. But God says in James 1 and verse 26, I can call myself that. I can think myself that all day long. But if I don't learn to bridle my tongue and wrestle that thing into submission and say, I'm not going to say that. God says your religion, thinking and claiming that you are a Christian, is absolutely useless. Jesus said, for every idle word men may speak, they will give account on the day of it, in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. You want to overcome and overpower these things? 1 Peter 3 and verse 10 says, He who would love life, see good days without storms. Let him keep his tongue from evil. Let him refrain his speech. Learn to control what he says. We come back to James chapter 1, verse 27. The Bible says, if I want to overpower these spiritual storms that come in my life, I need to get involved in encouraging those in need. He says in verse 27, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their trouble. You know what helps, should help us, to not be tempted to do wrong. You know it should help us to stop sinning. You know it should help us to overpower spiritual storms. Start doing good to others. Have you ever visited somebody in the hospital and you walked away feeling better 
uh, you, you walked away thinking you did more for yourself than you did for the person you just visited. You ever done that? You ever, you ever done something for someone else? You've taken, something, taken a meal over to someone's house who was in need, and you walked away thinking, you know, that, that was better for me than it was for them. Uh, I, when we are serving others, are we thinking about sinning? When we're serving others, is the devil, is the devil working? Does the devil have us? We're so far from the devil when we have our sights set on doing good unto others. Maybe that's why we call that the golden rule. Maybe that's why we have elevated that rule above all others. Not just that I do unto others as I would have them do unto me, but I just do unto others. I serve them. And when I do that, Jesus says in John 13, you're doing what I taught you to do. And at that moment, the devil doesn't have me. At that moment, I am preventing a spiritual storm from coming in my life. Finally, at the end of verse 27, final thing we see in this context about overpowering these spiritual storms is that we need to refrain from worldliness. The end of this chapter says, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, is to keep oneself unspotted from the world. God says, come out from among them. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Don't be like the rest of the world. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. God says, be ye holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. Don't look at everybody else and say, I want to be like them. Look at Jesus and say, I want to be like him. And when I do that, I can have the power to overpower the devil. I can have the power to overpower those spiritual storms that the devil is trying to bring into my life. You know, these spiritual storms, they're like some storms we face. They'll come and go. These spiritual storms, they're like other storms. Some are stronger, some are weaker, some are bigger, some are smaller. But it doesn't matter their size. It doesn't matter how long they stay. These spiritual storms have the ability to separate us from our God. Separate us now and separate us for all of eternity. And because of that, we must give our undivided attention to preparing for them and overpowering them when they come. And isn't it amazing that in this context, God's given us nine keys to unlock that ability to be able to overpower. Where are you in your relationship with the Lord this day? You know, He's given us a promise. He's given us a promise that when He forgives us of our sins, sometimes those spiritual storms come and we give in to them. It causes us to sin. Sin, when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. We're separated from our God. But God's promise is that when He forgives us, He will Never recall it against us again. He will remember it no more. Have you been forgiven by God to the point that He will remember that against you no more? Do you have the promise this day of eternal life with Him? Just as we prepare for any storms in life, we need to prepare for going to heaven. Prepare for having eternal life with him in heaven. And it starts by believing that Jesus is the Son of God. It starts by believing that Jesus came to this earth from heaven, came down as God on this earth, as Emmanuel. He lived a sinless life. He was in all points tempted, but he never gave in to those temptations. He went to that cross as the perfect sinless Lamb of God, took all of my sins upon him, took all of your sins upon him, died on that cross, shedding his blood, and on the third day he was raised from the dead. Do you believe that with all of your heart? If you do, the Bible says in John 1 and verse 12, you've got the right to become a child of God. You've got that right if you will repent and turn away from your sins. 
make up your mind, I want to stop doing wrong and start doing what's right, turn my life over to God, doesn't mean you're ever going to be perfect. Doesn't mean you're never going to be touched by the devil. Doesn't mean you're never going to have spiritual storms. But it's a mindset that says, God, I want to serve you instead of me. I want to do your will instead of my will. And with that, that mindset, it leads to a desire, Jesus says, to confess the faith that is in our heart and to be baptized, to be immersed into Christ where the blood of Jesus will wash away every sin we've ever committed and God won't remember that we ever committed them. And God will add me to his church and write my name down in heaven. Have you ever been baptized for the remission of your sins? Be added to the Lord's church by God himself. If you've never done that, why don't you bring Christ your broken life today and give it to him. Maybe you're a child of God. After you're baptized, that's not the end. That's the beginning of a life of faithful service to him, walking in the light as he is in the light and allowing the blood of Jesus to just keep on washing away your sins as you serve him. But sometimes as children of God, sometimes the devil even gets us. He gets us off course. He gets us to stray and to do that which is not right. Sometimes our life ends up being a total mess. Where are you today? Have you ever been baptized? You've been baptized. Are you walking in the light as he is in the light? Do you need to bring Christ to your life today to say, Lord, I can't put it back together. I need you. I can't fix this. I need you. I can't save myself. I need you. This church can help you today. Would you come right now as together we stand and sing for your encouragement?